Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's uh, series lecture in the UVA um, Radiology and Medical Imaging uh, National and International Keynote Lecture Series. We have an extraordinary panel tonight of lectures and discussions on an incredibly topical and important subject. And you can see the title intended to be a bit provocative. Yes, you addressing anti racism and cultural and self awareness in healthcare. Um, I want to take a brief moment to introduce our three panelists and not uh, um, waste any of the valuable time for the conversation. There will be opportunities for discussion in the end, and please do reach into the chat box as well. Um, we have attorney Sanford Williams, who has been an attorney since 1999 in various capacities, but importantly with the Federal Communications Commission. Um, also serving on the Manassas, uh, Virginia uh, School Board for over a decade and its chair for the last several years as well. And uh, very involved with various committees at the University of Virginia, at the uh, uh, University of Virginia Physicians Group, it's a Virginia Parents Group as well. Um, uh, Professor Carolyn Meltzer, Executive Associate Dean for Faculty Academic Development, Leadership and Inclusion at Emory University. The uh, president of the Academy of Radiology and Medical Imaging, president elect for the Society of Chairs of Academic Radiology, um, and has also developed the Emory Radiology Leadership Academy and served on the American College of Radiology Board of Chancellors and the Executive Committee for International Society um, of Neuroradiology. And also, um, not last, and not least, Dr. Alex Norbash, who is now the chair and professor of radiology at UCSD in San Diego. He had been chair and professor at BU, my alma mater, um, from 2004 to 2015, and has been the uh, UCSD associate vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Also the president of the American Rentgen Race Society and vice president of the American College of Radiology and a past chair of SCAR, the Society of Chair of Academic Radiology. This is but an incredibly short list of um, our speakers' accomplishments, um, uh, an extraordinary group. And tonight, our um, plan is uh, first some introduction and case scenarios by Mr. Williams, then Professors Meltzer and Norbash, and then returning to Mr. Williams, and then an open discussion for people. So with that, um, Sanford, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Haskell. I appreciate it. And let me see if I can share my screen. Click on the wrong, the right thing, I should say, to, to share. Let's see here. PowerPoint. There we go. All right, on the right page, too. So, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so, good yes. Evening. All right. Thank you. Thanks to the UVA Radiology Department for having me. Uh, I'm gonna start with a story. About 30 years ago, there was a young father, African-American, 22 years old, with two Ivy League degrees. He started college at the age of 15. He enjoyed going to the grocery store, but he noticed that he was frequently followed and that many women clutched their purses in his presence. He did not feel safe. One day, he went to the store with his two children and he noted that he felt totally comfortable. He realized that at the store and other situations, having his kids with him created a different dynamic. He felt safe. That young man was me. And that is why one of my now three children or my wife accompanied me to the grocery store for most of the last 30 years. That may seem like a small thing, but until I shared this experience in an online post last year, I had never been shared this explicitly with my wife. After reading it, she said, I just thought you'd go taking the kids to the store, which I did. But I realized when I wrote that piece last year that my experience was a fallout of the racism that permeates every aspect of our society. In 1903, W.B. Du Bois said, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Unfortunately, Du Bois was prescient then. And now over 100 years later, the problem of this century is still the problem of the color line. From 1619 until now, all lives have not equally mattered in America. Let me give you two other quick examples before we jump into racism in the medical context 
and later some anti-racism strategies. My first example is my son Sanford, who is a UVA grad and currently a pediatrician in New York City. When he was in seventh grade, he went to his first high school football game with his sister Kiara, who was in ninth grade then and is now a UVA grad and a UVA law school grad. After the game, when Kiara and Sanford arrived home, he told me casually that he was with some middle school friends at the game and he, the only black child in his group, was searched by the police for drugs. And no, he didn't have any drugs or anything else on him. He was obviously disturbed, but not surprised because my wife and I continuously warned him and all our children starting at a young age that this type of encounter was possible and likely probable for each of them, especially my son. Despite this preparation, it was neither a welcome nor pleasant experience. It angered my wife and me and required us to have a meeting with the chief of police to address it. We knew why this happened. We just wanted to make sure it didn't happen again. Through this, Sanford had to be resilient, face his classmates and the middle school gossip and rumors on Monday and the following days and carry on. Imagine, what if that was your child or your patient? How would you feel? What would you say? What would you do? The second example is my wife, Dr. Anastasia Williams, a pediatrician and a proud UVA med school grad who practices in Northern Virginia. My wife is a wonderful and compassionate doctor and person who has always gone the extra mile for her families. She was on the phone one day with one of these families, specifically the mom of a white patient. And during the conversation, Anastasia could clearly hear the dad yell in the background to the mom, are you still on that phone with that N word doctor? And I won't say the word. So he said, I quote, are you still on the phone with that N word doctor? The doctor taking care of his daughter. Anastasia continued the call with the mom and she didn't really process it then. And we talked about it later and it still affects her deeply if she thinks about it too hard. But that's not the only time she has heard that word uttered about her by a white patient or family member. If people feel comfortable addressing their doctors like that, is there any question that racism is still an insidious part of the fabric of our society? Educational attainment and accomplishments don't confer any magical status on one's ability to be racist or experience racism. Unfortunately, I have many more examples in clinical and non-clinical contexts. But one point I wanna communicate is that even for a family like mine, and we're not special, we're just hardworking folks, but a family like mine, all five of us went to UVA, four have graduated, one hopefully in May, I'm not, I'm not going to wait. We have two physicians, two attorneys, and a daughter, Nia, who currently lives in the lawn, which is the picture behind me. And that's why I had the picture up because I kind of want to feel close to her, um, even though she wouldn't want me there right now. But she's living on the lawn this year and graduating in May. But even with those accomplishments, we're not immune from racism at work or at play. Our accomplishments as a family don't make us special, and none of us want special treatment. We just want to live our lives and not work us or those who look like us experiencing the ravages of racism ranging from a murder like Breonna Taylor's to being denied a quality education, experiencing the digital homework gap, hearing false arrest, or being called for my wife and my son, an inward doctor. This racism causes trauma. Dr. Vander Kolk writes in The Body That Keeps the Score, trauma leaves imprint on body, mind, and soul. As practitioners, this helps you reflect on how you would interact with patients and their families or your colleagues who share these experiences with you. And understand that even if they don't share these experiences with you, they have quite possibly had traumatic experiences. This trauma, unfortunately, is not unusual or unique. It is evident in the aftermath of patient encounters for the tennis player, Serena Williams, Dr. Susan Moore, and in recent NFL, National Football League, race norming of cognitive functions to establish baseline for concussion protocols. And it's evident in the plethora of disparate health outcomes ranging from COVID-19 to a project taken up by Benita Mayo and the UVA's Equity Center to document pregnancy inequities. Dr. Irene Mathieu, an assistant professor of PEDS at UVA Health, noted that a 2016 UVA study on infant mortality comparing black babies to white babies found that the mortality rate was 26.3 for black babies, but for white babies, it was 2.6. Think about that, 2.6 versus 26.3. We even have present disparities in COVID vaccinations. In many states, 
The Latinos and Black Americans disproportionately suffer from the effects of COVID. They are being left behind and not being vaccinated at the same rate as white Americans. A New York Times article last week noted, although low-income communities of color have been hit hardest by COVID-19, health officials in many cities say that people from wealthier, largely white neighborhoods have been flooding vaccination appointment systems and taking an outside share of limited supply. February is Black History Month. 28 or 29 days when we pay attention to the contribution of African Americans and then frequently put them away until the following year. The honor of having a month is great, but the concept that a month can capture an essential part of the DNA of America is disheartening. As noted in a New York Times article today, James Baldwin stated previously, it comes as a great shock to discover the country which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and you identify has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. Baldwin understood that the ability to rationalize away Black Americans' place in the system of reality was due to a powerful commitment to not knowing the past of Black folks. As he cogently noted, if one has got to prove one's title to the land, isn't 400 years enough? I will end my opening remarks with this. I know through my work as a board member at UPG, especially from my wife and son, that there is a tangible and sometimes hidden impact on medical providers from the pandemic. We call you heroes. And you are heroes, all healthcare workers and folks who work um, in the arena. But many of you are exhausted. I applaud you for your work and urge you to make sure you care for yourselves and each other as you would your patients. I also urge you to keep in mind that many providers of color must also deal with an added tax, a black and brown tax, if you will, the toll of addressing trauma and racism in their own lives, clinical and academic settings, and their communities. Thank you for listening. I look forward to the discussion and hope that you come away better informed and committed to helping change the world around you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, Dr. Meltzer. Um. Well, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Mr. Williams and Dr. Norbash. I'm just trying to uh, share my slides. I'm sure it's allowing me to. Okay. You see my slides? Yes, perfect. All right. So I think Mr. Williams really set the stage for um, this thought provoking seminar during uh, Black History Month. It's also, uh, as he noted, a very challenging time. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, further about systemic or structural racism in medicine, how it is part of the fabric of our institutions. It is in the air we breathe. And if you think about it in the larger term of society, structural racism refers to the totality of, of ways that in our society, um, there are imbalances and disadvantages that are just continuously reinforcing, whether it's economic, social, uh, health, uh, educational, and it leads to persistence and a vicious cycle. But in medicine, our systems were really um, created uh, in a structure um, that was largely white and male. And how do we talk about race in medicine? Race is a social construct. It is important, but it is not uh, a um, surrogate for genetics. Uh, and we often use it as such. We often over-medicalize race. So while there's some conditions that are link to race or geography or where groups of people have come, we know, especially from the Human Genome Project, that genetics is, is a very poor reflection of race. And yet we've built into a number of our medical um, uh, clinical decision-making race as a surrogate for genetics. There's inadequate education on the role that medicine plays in perpetuating health inequalities. Uh, we talk about wanting to achieve health equity, 
Yet here in, in COVID, we have seen really the most blatant of um, inequities uh, affecting our communities. There are disparities in access to diagnostics, differential treatment. Which, uh, we also are now seeing it with not only um, the ability to stay safe from COVID, but also in uh, acquiring the vaccine. Skewed historical perspectives. Um, when I went to medical school, we had a mandatory course on the history of medicine. Um, and it was glorious. Um, it was not diverse in any way. Um, and there's a lot that I did not learn that I've learned since about the history of medicine. And we sometimes use imprecise and inappropriate um, uh, use of race and ethnicity in medical education materials. Um, and we know from recent studies that medical students often um, have misconceptions because they're still inadequate. Um, explanation of racial um, differences in disease processes that may likely be due much more to structural racism than to uh, genetics compliance, other things that we're, we're taught to associate. So what's widely held in, in medicine? It's um, the accomplishments and discoveries of, of white men disproportionately to contributions of others. What is rarely taught is that many of our institutions um, that we love and revere had their roots in slavery and putting my, my own institution there first and also yours. But many wonderful institutions have roots in uh, the economics of slavery, buildings that were built by enslaved um, humans um, and embracing um, Scholars, who, and we just had a meeting about this today at my own institution of buildings named for those who um, studied eugenics or um, embraced the science or pseudoscience that underpinned um, much of the um, early century on uh, differences in race and some some well known names. And of course, a sad history around medical education, which leads to distrust. Um, the history of medicine, the AMA refused to seat black delegates and uh, it wasn't until 2008 that the AMA apologized to the uh, National Medical Association um, for that um, terrible moment where uh, the two delegates were refused to be seated. So I've been in Atlanta for 15 years. It wasn't until several years in that I under, uh, the, that I heard the term the Grady's. So Grady Hospital is our large county hospital. Um, it largely serves um, some of our poor and marginalized communities, and it's a very special place for all of us and our trainees. And um, and somebody said, "Oh, the, yeah, I remember the Grady's." And I said, "What was that?" And it was segregated towers. There were two towers, and one was the white Grady and one was the colored Grady. I was horrified that I didn't know that about my own institution, that history. We're working on a project at Emory to really teach the history of medicine uh, in a more realistic and humbling way. We really over-medicalize race. So how do we describe patients? The first thing we train our medical students to say on rounds is um, age, race, ethnicity, and gender. So what does that conjure up if I say a 78-year-old black man, 34-year-old white woman? Um, so we introduce race immediately into our clinical decision-making and, and open it up to our clinical bias. There's assumptions that are, um, and associations that are common around which patients are compliant their socioeconomic status, the perceived likelihood of success of treatment. So we introduce all that bias, the first uh, thing we say about a patient. Um, we have formulas like the GFR equation that incorporates race into uh, determining kidney failure. Um, that is 
likely a false um, and inappropriate construct. And there's many things like that um, that have been incorporated into practice and have a long time to get out of practice. Um, and the literature does a very poor job of monitoring which papers appropriately or inappropriately um, filter hypotheses and findings and interpretations by race and ethnicity. Um, there's a recent paper, um, obviously recent, it's about COVID, that uh, hypothesized that there was a high minority rate of COVID due to genetic differences in nasal ACE receptor density. Why wasn't this caught early on by the editor to say this doesn't make genetic sense? Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a PNAS survey that, that was done not too long ago where medical students, this is 2016, medical students didn't know the difference between fact and myth about biological race differences, such as around skin thickness, sensitivity to pain, sense of smell. How do we make our clinical decisions? We make them in an analytical way. We relate signs and symptoms to diagnoses um, and in a non-analytical or pattern recognition way. And as radiologists, we know we rely a lot on pattern recognition, which um, causes us to associate what we see with our past experiences. Um, that can be more automatic, less conscious, and potentially more, more subject to uh, more subject to bias. Um, there's much in the literature around um, health and equity and health disparities, and I think it's not been till relatively recent that radiologists have realized that this is part of uh, has to be part of what we focus on. Um, we know there's a racial gap in empathy and perception of pain that leads to differences between Black and non-Black patients in opioids prescribed. Um, this starts, health inequity starts in childhood. We see this with kids in, in, in pediatric settings. Um, this was an interesting study that um, pediatricians who had the bias around associating medical compliance with more with their white patients than with African-American patients were more likely to prescribe narcotic medication for the same condition for white patients and not for black patients. We've seen this, you know, even in subtle ways. This was a study in 2016 that looked at um, it was an actor study, and these were uh, patients and um, uh, uh, and their family members in a scenario uh, in which a physician was going to come in and, and give bad news. The patient was not doing well. The physicians were true physicians. They were mostly white male physicians. Um, and these were experienced physicians who had a script and a way to approach patients in an empathetic and caring way to deliver bad news. So that verbal communication was similar regardless of whether the patient and family were white or non-white. But the white physicians were less likely to touch the patient, make eye contact, and more likely to stand near the door when the patient was non-white. Patients sense that. Patient touches with the physician is really important. So we show our bias even in unconscious ways. And, you know, what about imaging prescribed? Uh, imaging is, you know, we all feel strongly that imaging is a key to uh, making the appropriate diagnosis early on in many, many conditions. And when patients come to the emergency department, um, Black and Hispanic patients are less likely to receive imaging less likely to receive imaging. And when they do, white patients are still more likely to get high-end imaging like CT as opposed to ultrasound. We know we like to follow appropriateness criteria. Why would that be different? There's about a hundred clinical or cognitive biases rather that come into play in clinical decision-making. 
And I'll just mention a few. Affinity bias. We overvalue people with whom we share something in common. This reminds, patient reminds me of my grandfather. Um, and, you know, there is that sort of connection we have with people who seem like they're more like our family. The framing effect is the influence of how information is presented. And that is that presenting race right up front, presenting um, other connotations about a patient, frequent flyer, um, chronic. There are ways we frame that we conclude in our brain, we make associations of the, how we see the patient, the likelihood of treatment, success of appropriate diagnostic, diagnostics. You know, we all like to, what, diagnostic momentum is when we all kind of get around a diagnosis and reinforce it. Um, and it's hard to correct an incorrect diagnosis. Um, satisfaction of search, we're all familiar with as radiologists. Uh, I mentioned the difficult patient or frequent flyer. Uh, there's a Seinfeld uh, where Elaine gets labeled as a difficult patient, and it's, uh, it, it's quite funny in a biting way that we do this. And anchoring bias is when we um, just kind of rely on our initial impression about a patient, whether they're compliant, whether they're, um, you know, whether it's their fault they're back in the hospital. Um, and those can be hard to shake. And I'll just mention, this is um, true of the workforce uh, in my health system. So, um, you know, and live in the wonderful city of Atlanta. It is a highly diverse community. Um, our healthcare workers um, tend to reflect the makeup of the community. But when we look at what that stratification is, largely um, it, it uh, looks less and less like our community as we look at our physicians as opposed to our, our nurses and technologists. And certainly, you know, at leaders in the institution. So we have a ra racial and ethnic stratification of the healthcare workforce. Uh, just um, mentioning a series that we did um, really exploring racism, social justice, and its implications for medicine. Uh, this is available uh, and open to the public. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Metzler. That's wonderful. And um, Dr. Norbash, if you want to uh, begin, and then we can have some wonderful discussion. We've got a tremendous audience tonight. Dr. Haskell, can you hear me? Carolyn, can you hear me? Oh, oh. Yeah, I look good. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to discuss, well, if I may first, let me start by sharing uh, my learning objectives. <clears throat> the first has to do with ourselves and recognizing that socioculturally we have unconscious bias. And therefore, we have to be perpetually and endlessly vigilant and self-critical. The second thing has to do with system. It is possible to create systems that are anti-racist. It has to be done intentionally. The third learning objective has to do with expectations. We are not going to solve this. This is a problem we will live with for our lifetimes. After 400 years of history, it's not going to change. And therefore, we have to be committed to pursuing positive change. And the finish line is past the end of our time on Earth as individuals. In way of disclosures, I'm a scientific advisor to IBM, Siemens, GE, Stryker, and Penumbra, and I co-founded the Boston Imaging Coral Laboratories. So let's first acknowledge the pain of racial trauma. Today, we see that silence is not an option. 
And this is a time to focus on the fact that we are talking about underrepresented minorities and the fact that black lives matter. And um, as Dr. Meltzer pointed out, radiology is expensive. Radiological services are not easy to come by. And therefore the dispossessed and the disenfranchised are the individuals who suffer the most. So we as radiologists are responsible for solving part of the problem and a significant part of the problem. A wonderful article having to do with self-reflection and insight where Unconscious Bias is Concerned was written by Deborah Cohen in February of 2019. She saw herself as a liberal and accepting OBGYN, trying to be more self-critical and less self-congratulatory about how open-minded and wonderful liberal she was. And she realized this with the passage of time. For example, she recently had scheduled an appointment for a white woman to have a checkup on a non-clinical day of hers, recognizing she probably made an exception in that case and may not have done it for an underrepresented minority. She caught herself realizing that she was sitting far back from a black patient in the patient's hospital bed further than she normally would have, again, recognizing that shortfall, just as Dr. Meltzer showed in terms of um, the actors and physicians walking into the room. She also mistook one resident for another black resident and she believes that that would not have happened with two white residents. And she also believes that she orders more drug screening tests on black patients. I congratulate her for her insight and her perception and her self-criticality. And that is something that we need to learn. We need to learn to be self-critical, to understand the scope of the problem, to be able to effectively address it. An article in Harvard Business Review published in September of 2020, try to figure out how can you promote racial equity in the workplace using a systems-based approach. <clears throat> the problem of racism is frequent, prevalent, insidious, and inapparent to whites. <clears throat> the opportunity exists for leaders to change the status quo but they have to develop and champion initiatives in order to do so. Not incremental initiatives, but bold initiatives. And finally, effective forward motion demands understanding the underlying condition, developing genuine concern, and putting in place corrective actions. Fast relief is not possible. Again, there is not a clear finish line. Corrections demand a lifetime commitment to this space. And also we recognize that if whites in the organization feel they are victims of reverse discrimination, the hill is going to be steeper. What does a staged approach consist of? Well, it consists of awareness of the problem, analyzing the root causes, generating empathy so there can be a motivation to solve the problem, formulating specific strategies to address the issues, and finally recognizing that it necessitates an investment of time, resource, and energy as a priority. Let's talk a little bit about empathy versus sympathy. Again, we're trying to generate empathy about the problem and the individuals who are caught up in the problem. Sympathy has to do with generating feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune by feeling along with them. It is a common feeling. On the other hand, empathy is the result of an effort to inhabit that other person's persona, to fully understand, more fully understand how it feels to be in that other person's shoes, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And so in terms of, again, a methodical approach to promoting racial equity in the workplace, we have to take the pulse of an organization. We need to understand whether the problem is tangible or whether it's buried and needs to be uncovered. 57% of whites and 66% of working class whites consider discrimination against whites to be as big a problem as against blacks and underrepresented minorities. This makes the hill that much steeper to climb. Or if you believe that your organization is not racist because organizations are racist. A root cause analysis demands a need to look at 
the structural contributors to racism. For example, institutional practices. Are your search committees adequately representing underrepresented minorities on them? Is that a mandate and is it being followed? How about cultural norms? What about the individuals who choose to go and play golf together to make a business decision or hang out together or go to each other's country clubs? How does that allow us to create an equitable and a just society when cultural norms create a sense of isolation and separation inappropriate? How do we cultivate empathy? Well, we do it by sharing stories, by sharing difficult stories and having safe listening sessions that allow us to learn about the depth and the breadth of the problem, which is insidious and persistent. And what kind of strategies can be applied? What strategies are there for addressing racism? Well, personal attitudes through self-criticality and the desire and the intent to address them. Understanding what informal cultural norms exist that are biasing agents. Recognizing what institutional policies are flawed. Let me give you the example of one effective approach. There's a large part of Boston where I lived for 17 years that was being developed by uh, mass ports called the Seaport uh, District. And when they were setting up an understanding of how to grant contracts to builders, they didn't only focus on developer experience and capital, revenue potential and architectural design. One quarter of the equation had to do with a comprehensive diversity and inclusion plan and reflection of those values by the contractor. Again, this demands a certain level of insight and formality to establish the appropriate changes. Promoting racial equity in the workplace is viewed by some as an untoward sacrifice. And what you will find is, are there individuals who believe that having disabled parking lot spots are unfair? Why give the best parking spots to individuals who are uh, disabled? I have personally heard from numerous individuals who feel that paid parental leave is unfair because if they choose not to have children, why should they be penalized by not having parental leave? Um, and there are ways of looking at this in terms of helping uncover problems. Harvey Mudd College, which is one of the, Cla the seven Claremont colleges, put into place a new course for introductory computer science for students who had zero experience with computers. 50% turned out to be women. So again, there are thoughtful ways of uncovering structural bias that exists. And in terms of looking at policies and procedures, re-examine the convention's policies and procedures that create bias. For example, understand how you can create policies that protect underrepresented minorities who are healthcare workers from patient bias. We had an orthopedic surgery resident last year who was ridiculed um, because of who he was. And he was ridiculed by a husband and wife who were clearly messaging that they did not approve of him. How can you tolerate having patients who are difficult patients of that, that brand in terms of what uh, Carolyn was pointing out, Dr. Meltzer? We need to learn how we can correct patient behavior and perhaps even discharge patients and dismiss them from our systems if they're unable to behave appropriately. In terms of fostering cultural authenticity, this can be a significant problem. I have two close friends who were black and had dreadlocks and chose to cut their dreadlocks because of professional pressure or because of promotions that they chose to take. That's completely unacceptable. In terms of effective expressions of empathy, how does this occur? Well, uh, one example of cultural humility and recognizing that we are not culturally superior. If we venerate the philosophers of ancient Greece and we do not learn about the philosophers of Africa or of Asia, haven't we created cultural superiority based on classicism? Sponsorship. We need to actively support individuals. It has to be part and parcel of what we do on a daily basis, understanding how do we help promote individuals who are held back socioculturally? And how do we engage in allyship? Which means building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability over the course of a lifetime. Again, this is a marathon and demands a long-term commitment. Again, 
This is not self-defined. We can't pat ourselves on the back and talk about how enlightened or woke we are. This is something that others have to admit after we have been uh, expending efforts in this space for a considerable amount of time. We also have to create bias correcting education. We have to understand how pervasive and universal unconscious bias is. We need to uncover it and address it in ourselves. We need to respect how we engage with microaggressions that we see around us. We have to be fearless to stop bias where we see it expressed publicly. We have to create inclusive leadership. And finally, we need to be upstanders, we need to stand up for social justice. One of the prime examples of this is with elder abuse, where upstandership is clearly seen as a motivating force. So there are foundational elements to how we create this kind of an environment. The first is recognizing that crucial conversations, emotional conversations will take place. And for them to take place and for us to establish dialogue, which means a bi-directional information flow, receiving and transmitting, we have to create safe spaces. Individuals have to feel as though they can express themselves without being judged. We have to have those crucial conversations. How about abusive behavior initiatives? Well, we have to create an environment where it's understood that bullying is not tolerated. That expectation has to be voiced. We have to be able to gather information when bullying events occur. We have to be able to do remediation and reconciliation when possible. And we have to uncover the resources that are available to do the coaching, to do the education, and to hold people accountable. And sometimes you have to speak the language of the larger organization. If you have to make a business case for diversity, you can, because sometimes that's the necessary ingredient to get things moving in the right direction and to have the correct level of executive sponsorship. So in summary, the change is up to you and me, and it's going to take our full lifetimes to achieve. And therefore, if we want to succeed, we have to define our clear and achievable goals, and we have to achieve. We have to know where the finish line is. Equally extraordinary. Thank you, Dr. Norbash. And we're um, back to Mr. Williams to round this out for us. You can unshare or Sanford, you can take over. It's always the inelegant pause of virtual meetings. <laughs> so Sanford is bringing that up. We've had a personal scenario to set a stage for this. We've understood this more about the scope of the actual problem in medicine and also in institutions and structure. And now um, to, to bring the other rounded into it. Great, you're up, Sanford. And we can see your conclusion slide, but we can't yet hear you. You're muted. It's where you wave the magic wand and all sound turns on. So as you're bringing that up, I'm thinking of, of just a couple of messages that I'm learning from this, which is race does not have a biological basis. The race has been and continues to be an important determinant of disparate health outcomes, especially in the US. Sanford, you, when you're ready, then please bring up your slide. Um, okay, got myself off. Key determinant. Wonderful. There. Can you see the slide? Perfect. Perfect. Thanks for being patient. Um, so before I get to my conclusion and talk about what's there, um, I'm going to take a point of privilege and um, just thank some folks. Uh, I've been at UVA or fully UVA a long time, and um, there have been a lot of folks who've been very helpful. So I'm going to mention those folks quickly and then get to my conclusion. Um, I've been a member of the UP board for three years, and I want to thank all my friends and colleagues on the board for their help, dedication, and support. I can't name everybody. Uh, and I apologize to those I, I missed, but I want to give a quick shout out to some of the folks who've been especially helpful. 
Professor Laura Morgan Roberts, uh, Letty Bien, Dr. Tom Daniel, Chair Julie Speesmaker, former Chair George Pace, Marge Connolly, Gloria Rockhold, Becky Compton, Mark Lorenzoni, Dr. Saavedra, who I noticed is on the chat tonight, uh, Dr. Chabra, and UB UPG employees, Corey Feist, who's doing great work with the Learner Breen Heroes Foundation, Mary Francis Sutherland, Mary McKenzie, Melanie Evans, and Kara Comer. I also have, over the years, um, had a number of friends in the UVA Medical Center med school community who've been very helpful and inspiring. I want to cite some of them pretty quickly. Um, Dr. Pollard, Dr. Vivian Penn, Dr. Meg Keeley, Dr. Mark Keeley, Dr. Irene Mathieu, Dr. Ebony Hilton, Dr. Julie Matsumoto, Dr. Paige Powers, Dr. Susan Modisett, Dr. Karen Johnston, Dr. Sharita Hill-Golden, Dr. Liz Carr, Dr. Joe Bruce, Dr. Lois Davis, Sarah Rothschild and Barry Collins in the Alumni Association, Pamela Sutton-Wallace, Dr. Leanne Webb, Dr. Cameron Webb, Dr. Tyson Bell, my UVA law classmate, Janine Miller, um, Dr. Karen O'Brien from Nobant UVA Health, who helped me compile a lot of the resources that I have in my last slide, uh, and Al Pylon, the Novant CEO um, here in Northern Virginia, uh, Dr. Rhonda Bass and some of my life's 1998 med school classmates, uh, and med school dean, Dr. David Wilkes. Finally, I want to thank my co-presenters, Dr. Meltzer and Dr. Norbash. I learned so much from your presentations. I was taking notes uh, feverishly, uh, and I'm honored to be here with you tonight. And finally, uh, I must thank my wife, Anastasia, our three kids, Sanford, Anastasia, and Nia, my daughter-in-law, who's a UVA med grad, uh, and nicely, um, and the radiology department, uh, Jordan Webb, Dr. Haskell, and my very good friend, Dr. Alexamoto, for his mission to proactively address inequity, bias, and racism. So, sorry for the long list, but I want to recognize those folks have been very helpful. But to my conclusion, so first, and this has been mentioned, um, I think we have to recognize that racism and bias exist, covertly, overtly, and systemically in all aspects of our lives. And after recognizing that, reflect on how racism and bias impacts our lives and you personally, especially in the practice of medicine. Devise strategies to address racism and bias. I think education is the key. You need to consistently and affirmatively seek information. My wife constantly talks about the tests she takes frequently, the, the uh, books she reads, the in uh, discussion she has about pediatrics and medicine. Um, and in order to gain knowledge in any field, you can't be static, you have to be dynamic. Um, so in the field of anti-racism or being an anti-racist, you must constantly seek information. I mentioned uh, on this slide, the New York Times 1619 Project is a great illuminating tool for general education, but there are lots of other ones uh, in the medical context and, and elsewhere. Uh, White Fragility is a great book to read, How to Be an Anti-Racism and How to Be an Anti-Racist by Kendi and so many other resources. In order to be anti-racist, you must fight racism actively. You can't be passive. Um, and you need to talk with people with different experiences, listen to their stories. Oftentimes I find, even as medical practitioners, um, in the case of most of you, folks don't take time to listen to other folks' stories. When you hear their stories, you find first that you have lots in common, um, but even more, you find that um, there may be things they experience that you don't know, which will help you when you relate to them. Um, hold yourself and others accountable. We don't do that enough. I think both the doctors mentioned that earlier. Um, if you don't hold folks accountable, um, you're not gonna accomplish anything. And I think the most important thing you can do is to be intentional. Um, as I have seen in different contexts, whether it's my school board context or at the FCC where I work, um, what gets done is what gets done. If you're not intentional about increasing the numbers of African-Americans and Latinx folks in your sphere, um, in your departments, you're not going to change things. And in addition to that, I'd say be a mentor, be an ally, be persistent. Um, don't stop. Uh, the final thing I mentioned before I get to my concluding statement is that, again, take care of your mental health. I live with a doctor. I talk with them all the time. And um, you guys have a special challenge in the COVID pandemic. Please take care of your mental health. It's very important. Um, there's a concluding statement before we get to questions. Um, I mentioned earlier I wrote a piece um, about the George Floyd um, murder. And after the piece, I mentioned a lot of things. And I concluded it this way, and I think it's kind of pertinent to what we're discussing here. I wrote in that piece, at the end of the day, this is a heart issue. You can't legislate thought, you can't legislate compassion, and you can't legislate love. We are having a moment. We are living through history. The future is now. If we are authentic, vulnerable, and honest with ourselves and each other, we can really create a greater place where we can all breathe. We can do this, 
Together we go farther. Black Lives Matter. And I will conclude with that. And in my last slide, which I can email around later, um, are some resources and articles that I think um, are helpful. Um, and thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. That's that's extraordinary. Um, and we will make those resources available as well as we post this meeting. I'm I, I want to open the time for discussion. I'm struck by the multiple levels that we've talked about it from the very personal aspects that you opened with um, to the, the the scientific aspects that that um, use of race as a risk factor for health outcomes, as, as Professor Meltzer said, may just be um, faulty science uh, and that and that the the concept actually creates health disparities that we propagate because we're taught. I remember at BU, since uh, Alex mentioned it, that if you said jazz singer, then that immediately meant a drug addict. And that framed us. And that was the bias that you said. And and equally to mention at BU, um, but also to emphasize that there's a personal level, as you instruct us, Alex, that we have to think about how to make this how to actually feel this. And as you said, Sanford, and not just sort of think in terms of structures, what is that personal thing that we've experienced and we empathize that we can draw on, um, you know, to, to remind us as um, at, at those on the inside, how we're more sensitive to this. And um, you brought up something that I haven't thought about in almost 40 years of a, of a med school colleague who in 1980 had to remove his earring and actually have, the, have it uh, sewn shut because of the discrimination that would be uh, perceived at BU for being a homosexual advancing through med school. And it took me years to really begin to understand that. And yet, you know, we all have those kind of touch points that we need to be able to think about the, the facts, which are that there's no biological bias for this. And it's a, it's a continuing determinant to disparate health outcomes. Um, and, and how do we enact these things? So I'm, I've, I've put these out sort of to spur discussion or take it in any other direction. Alan, you're muted, but I think you're, um, I can I can feel you thinking uh, <laughs> toward us. You know, as we go through all this every process for ourselves and, you know, to recognize that it requires some intentional self-reflection you know. How do we learn, I'll ask the panelists, how do we learn or teach each other how to be less judgmental about people because of the way they look, the accent they may have, or just for our own biases with which we grew up. You know, I grew up as an Asian with Asian parents, and they would talk about some groups of people very differently. And Carolyn, people, they would describe people by their ethnicity and gender often, rather than by their name. So I, I asked the panelists, how do we learn to be less judgmental? people I'll get us started on that that's a great question I think the first um, thing is the um, the approach of continuous learning and as uh, dr. Norbress pointed out cultural humility I, I so love that term as opposed to cultural competence there is no fixed body of knowledge around all our intersectional identities and understanding each other as humans um, so continuously inquiring, um, challenging our own biases and learning about them. So, you know, if uh, folks haven't taken the unconscious um, the, uh, the implicit bias uh, tests, that can be having trusted colleagues who will call you out as you call them out. Um, oh, you know, I noticed you said, um, you know, um, Dr. Smith and and Julie, and Dr. Smith and, and Julie are both physicians. You know, oh, I can't believe I said that. I didn't realize that. But instead of saying, I didn't mean it that way, say, I'm going to try to be better next time. So it's a continuous journey and we're all on it. And we're all at different places in the journey. So to have some grace for others. 
or in a different place? It's not a checkoff list. It's hard work and we're trying to deal with our complacency and living in that discomfort, I think is what it sounds like we're talking about and, and being engaged with it uh, despite that. If I may, I think uh, self-criticality is really, really important. Um, recently, I had a colleague who said, I know you're doing a lot of work in the diversity space, but I've noticed something about you that you want to hear. I said, certainly. They said, it's, it's going to be a little painful. Do you want to hear it? I said, of course I want to hear it. My colleague said that you do two things. When you respond to women, you do so quickly. When you do so with men, you take your time. You're a little more deliberate, more thoughtful. What I've also noticed is that your tendency is to call women by their first name when they're physician colleagues. And with men, you will sometimes use an honorific title. And I listened to this person and I said, hey, I need to pay attention to this. I wasn't aware of that. I didn't get defensive. I didn't say you're wrong. I actually wondered about, my goodness, this is something that I'm doing right now. And here I am with people you know, having conversations about unconscious bias. So, the, the, you know, the, the activity and the innate nature of the bias and the desire to find out about it and try to fix it, it has to become incorporated into who you are. And you cannot be defensive if you're planning on moving this forward. And, and I, would, I would add in that um, I heard this somewhere and I don't know who said it, but um, it's hard to hate up close. I think the more we get close to folks and see that we have more in common than not, um, it's a great way to establish relationships. I love the term cultural humility, and we have to be intentional about that. And uh, something that I know my wife would say, don't just go to the one black colleague you have and have everybody burden that one clock, one colleague or the one Latinx colleague you have. You know, try to find other relationships if that's what that's all, all folks are in 128, but it's hard to hit up close. So if you get to know folks in the person, it helps immensely in that process that Dr. Matsumoto um, brought up with the question. Can I ask a question? Um, so I, one, I, I really like the idea of um, listening to stories, but I worry about um, if you are in a department where there cannot be a lot of um, uh, minority faculty or staff, putting people in the, on the spot and sort of isolating by sort of asking for their stories. How do you balance that? Where you, you want to hear the stories, but you don't want to make people feel isolated by telling their stories. Do you know what I'm saying? How do you work through that? Um, so I'm, I might say that, you know, we can't expect um, all our friends who are um, from underrepresented groups to have the burden of educating us. So we have to in engage in self-education as well, um, but try to catch ourselves from making assumptions and, and, and being open and asking, especially if we do have trusted relationships with those individuals, but it certainly can be tiresome um, to constantly explain to others what it's like to be in our own experiences. So I, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. Well, well, another, question. Oh, another aspect I was just going to mention is um, this has to be the work of all people. Um, so I realize I tap a lot of um, the same colleagues for DEI work and trying to figure out ways to um, one, make that more promotable service work, but also make sure that others are on those committees and that their turn on those committees means they're expected to work on these issues as hard as anybody else and, and to share that it's not any individual's work or any group's work. Dr. Harvey, I think that uh, a significant part of this is also in sponsorship. It has to be very clear that this is a priority from the top down. And, you know, again, if you have that opportunity outside of the department, it makes it that much easier. In our case, we have a CEO very committed to diversity, lives it, breathes it. And so that helps in terms of creating the right environment. 
because <laughs> they want to feel safe. They need to feel as though they can express their emotions, and they will do so in an incremental fashion, building trust over time. It does not happen in um, And I, was, I saw someone try to answer the question. I'm not sure who it was. Um, I'm not sure uh, Dr. Haskell saw that. Yes, Mr. McGinnis. Herschel, did you want to speak? I, I just wanted to relate. I think that was a wonderful question uh, that Dr. Harvey asked. And I would just say, if you're going to approach someone, do the hard work of actually having a relationship with them before you start asking these intense personal questions. I think people don't want to be treated like subjects being examined. They want to be your colleague and we all need friends and we all have work friends. To me, when people start asking me about my background, my personal history, if I feel like they're genuinely interested and they're, we're peers, we're equals, they can ask me the most offensive question in the world and they get a lot of free passes. But when someone I barely know wants to just open my personal life and start rifling through it, even done in the most polite way, it, it just, it, it, I don't think that's helpful. I think changing culture is extremely difficult, and we have to recognize that the roots of misogyny, homophobia, racism grow deep in our cultures, even within people in those suspect groups. And as I relate to Dr. Matsumoto, when I reflect back over my now 30-year career, I think about things that were done in the eventual realm 30 years ago, and I cringe. But at the time, I was modeling the behaviors of my attendings. And now that I'm the attending, I'm the one that has to set the example. I own that. I can be the one that changes the culture where I work. Was that okay to say? I think that was awesome. Um, and I see my wonderful wife on the screen. So she wants to chime in here. You're mute, honey. Hi, you guys have done a phenomenal <laughs> job. Um, thank you all. Can you hear me okay? Um, thank you all for just having this discussion. Those were great questions. I love us pointing out how important it is for us to actually do life with people that don't look like us so that we can experience each other's lives and learn in that. Um, one thing that came to thought from Amy uh, was that, um, you know, the whole issue of acknowledging, um, including um, a person's race when you talk about, when you present them as a patient, you know, that, that presents an interesting dilemma for me because, um, I feel like the, the bigger problem, um, Dr. Elsa, I was thinking about what you were saying, um, mm -hmm. is not so much that we say the different race of the person or sex, but it's our perception of that person and what we bring to that. Because we all know that it's critical and important for us to gather data and information about the experiences that people are having based on their race or sex, but how do we do that without diminishing them as a person? And, it, and it's not easy. It, it, it goes both ways, you know. Um, do I go the extra mile with this patient because I know more about their background or where they've been or what they're doing? Um, you know, do I feel do I feel more comfortable with patients like that? Which is why, honestly, we need um, a diverse uh, group of people it, providing care to these different uh, groups. Um, so it's just a thought. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think about that. You know, like how do you, as we teach new doctors and um, speak to each other, how do we acknowledge our differences um, in a way that does not make the, any person feel less than? I know that's a strange question. No, I, love, I love the nuance. Um, and texture you gave to that. I, I was referring to when we describe a patient and often that's not about self-identified um, characteristics. It's like, you know, the medical student is taught, I, I met this patient, here they are. Um, but I agree that the, 
understanding the experiences of our patients is very uh, important. I think just having race and ethnicity right up front in descriptions brings up and perpetuates those biases it, it, until we do really uh, dissect them, be self-reflective, um, and, and have a more open environment in medicine. It's complicated. I don't Dr. have a great answer. Dr. Is, I think something really important because um, what we is when physicians go into rooms, if they're making rounds, they, they may not be sensitive how they're presenting the patient and objectify the patient. And so I think that is really important in the sense of propriety about where and when you have certain conversations. Uh, to talk about somebody's obesity in front of them to four other people and not even talking to the victim, it's inconsiderate, it's rude, it's marginalizing, it's hurtful. So I think there, we need to have a greater level of sensitivity in terms of what conversations we have, which particular settings, what information is essential, what information is not essential. Um, and so I, I think you bring up some very, very good points. This idea that that um, that race it may be false science, rather than than, than, than you know than uh, I mean it, than rather than the situation that defines healthcare disparities, I mean that's a that's at the root of teaching. That is a top down issue that ha that is sort of missing from daily conversation. Which means we've got to model that. You know, uh, to mature physicians who are ingrained and been doing this for 50 years, all the way back to students, um, that's a big hill. How, how do we, you know, how, how do we make that a, a, a constant conversation um, across American medicine? Great question. Yeah, there's a lot to be looked at in terms of what we teach medical students. There are a lecture from 30 years ago, someone's continuing to give well, what are you know what are our patients asked to fill out in terms of paperwork i'm always horrified that there's still papers of that, that are running around the hospital that uh, uh, my colleagues will say oh we had the patient fill out this and when i look at it there's you know it, there's just misses in terms of self-identifiers what you know a openness of asking the questions that may be relevant but they're looked at, you know, the, the forms made up in one perspective and one experiences perspective. Um, so I think just having that lens and it'll take, a, you know, it takes the diverse workforce to have that broad lens to de-bias some of what we teach, some of what we subject our patients to, um, some of the assumptions we make continuously every day. And I can't always speak as a physician, but I can say from my work as an attorney and, and school board member. Um, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging differences, but the key I think we need to thing we need to do is acknowledge differences without diminishing the ones who And we're not going to be able to do that unless we do the things that you mentioned about being anti-racist. So I think it's fine to acknowledge differences in the clinical context, but it's diminishing the humanity that my wife so closely um, was alluding to. I think that it, that's where the problems come in. Uh, Dr. Z, Dan. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, I really appreciate you putting put this together and putting out some great talks. Um, the medical community is being um, urged to dismiss race uh, because it is a cultural construct, but I'm going to push back a little bit. On that. Uh, I think we actually need to determine how much race is cultural and how much is biological, because some of it is biological. And I'll give you two examples of this. When I was 15 years old, uh, I had a bone marrow biopsy because my white blood cell count was so great. It turned out it was normal. Well, I found out 30 years later when I visited China that the normal range for white blood cell counts in the United States is usually about 4 to 11. In China, it's three to eight. So this is not culture. This is not taught. This is biology. This is genetics. The second example, my wife is Caucasian and she's a redhead. Well, it turns out the same uh, genetics that causes a person to have red hair 
also affects the central nervous system's susceptibility to anesthetics and opiates. And it turns out redheads require higher amounts of anesthetics and opiates to achieve the same degree of pain control or, or anesthesia. Uh, and there aren't very many redheads outside of Northern uh, Europe. So I, again, this is not something that redheads were taught. This is something that's actually biology. So I think before we completely dismiss race, I think we have to discriminate what is actually cultural and what is actually genetic. Well, coming from our journal's editor, you've challenged us and you get to you get to shape the papers and how they uh, how they define that uh, for years to come. So, um, excellent. I think we're we're coming up on uh, the close of our hour and beyond. The discussion is wonderful. Um, any closing comments from any of our, our speakers in our giant audience? Um, speaking for myself, this is fabulous. I have a, a charge of things to think of in my head and how to. Um, try to be self more more self reflective, both on a scientific and modeling level, and also in day to day relations. I hope that that has charged many of our audience um, far more self reflective than me. I'm sure. Um, I'm very grateful to all of the speakers and all of you who participated. Um, this has been a spectacular evening. We'll have those resources that uh, um, Mr. Williams uh, shared with us available as soon as we post this. Thank you, um, Sanford. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Carolyn. And of course, uh, thank you to uh, Jordan and Terry Crow for uh, making another um, fabulous evening happen. Um, I wish you all well and peace. Good night, folks. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. So grateful for your knowledge. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Honored to be here. Thank you.